Aloha, my kako. Welcome to the joint hearing of AEN and TRS. It's Wednesday, February 10th, 2021. This is the one o'clock hearing. My housekeeping, housekeeping announcements. Uh, today's book of hearings is including the audio and video of remote participants is being streamed live on YouTube. You'll find the links to viewing options for all Senate meetings on the live and on-demand video page of the legislature's website at capital.hawaii.gov. And in the unlikely event that we have to abruptly end this hearing due to major technical difficulties, the committee will reconvene, discuss any outstanding business at 2.15 p.m. today uh, during our AEN via video conference time slot and a public notice will be posted on the legislature's website. For testifiers, all testifier audio will be muted and video disabled until shortly before it's your turn to testify. And because of our 90 minute time limit for each of the AEN hearings, There'll be a two minute time limit for all testifiers and we'll have a virtual countdown timer on the Zoom screen. So please be aware of the timer. I'll be announcing only the testifiers who will be providing testimony via Zoom. For the complete list of testifiers along with all of the written testimony, please go to the legislature's website and you'll find the link on the status page for the measure. We also apologize if the closed captioning doesn't accurately to, uh, transcribe the names. So starting off with SB 32 relating to infrastructure, uh, this requires public water or sewer utilities to consider the disruption to transportation as a criterion in planning future maintenance. And first up is we have Dean Nishina from DCCA. Uh, Good Dean. afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Gabbard, Chair Lee, members of the committee. We stand on our written testimony offering comments, but I'm available for questions if you have any. Thank you, Dean. Next, we have Jay Griffin from uh, the PUC. Good afternoon, chairs and members of the committee. Uh, we also, too, stand on our written testimony offering comments and available for any questions. Thank you. Okay, and members, that's it. Uh, any questions for our testifiers? All right, I have a question for the PUC for Jay. Uh, Jay, how many public water or sewer utilities are currently regulated by the PUC? I believe it's 39. And these are okay. generally small private uh, water and sewer utilities. Okay. So not the county board of water uh, sewer systems. Okay. Anything else? Okay, members, we'll go on to SB 491 relating to inspection fees. Okay, and this increases the inspection, quarantine, and eradication service fee and charge from 75 cents to $1.50 for every 1,000 pounds of freight or part thereof brought into the state. First up is Phyllis Shimabukuro Geyser with DOA. Good afternoon, Aloha Chair, Vice Chair, uh, Chair Lee, and members of both committees. Phyllis Shimabukuro Geyser, Hawaii Department of Agriculture. We stand on our written testimony, um, appreciating the intent of the measure. Uh, we are concerned about the added cost increase due to the doubling of the fee and its impact on our agriculture stakeholders and small businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. Next is Tom Yamachika from the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Uh, thank you, Chairs, Senators. Uh, Tom Yamachika from the Tax Foundation. Um, we, we now observe that this particular fee uh, is only being applied to um, imports by water and is not being applied to imports by air. Uh, we had suggested in our testimony that uh, the, uh, the committees look into uh, finding a way to uh, get the uh, get air freight to bear their fair share as well. Uh, there was a bill, I think, last year uh, that... Uh, uh, was a step toward doing that and you know perhaps that language could be resuscitated. All right, thank you, Tom. Next is Brian Miyamoto from the Hawaii Farm Bureau. Good afternoon, Chairs Gabbard and Lee, Vice Chairs Nishihara and Loy, uh, and members of the committee. Brian Miyamoto here on behalf of the Hawaii Farm Bureau. Uh, Chairs, I'd like to clarify our uh, testimony, which is in support 
we do support the intent of this measure. And thank you, Chair Gabbard, for introducing and hearing this measure. We all know how broken invasive species is, uh, not just to the agriculture community, but to our entire state. And you know, this uh, pest inspection, quarantine and eradication fund uh, goes a long way to provide stable funding to address uh, this terrible uh, uh, scourge on, on our state. You know, I believe back in 2004, LRB did a study that says the state would need to invest $50 million a year to address property invasive species. Uh, however, you know, doubling the, the fee uh, will increase the cost of doing business for not just our farmers, but for all businesses and ultimately result in possibly increase to our residents. And uh, in light of our economic situation right now, we're not sure if we like to see that. And especially for farmers, it's hard to pass on additional costs to their consumers and customers. So we just want to qualify that we do support the intent on uh, basic species, uh, coffee bear borer, little fire ants, mac filter cocks, and now we're dealing with two line spittle bug, coffee leaf defrost, uh, cocky frog, there's so many of them, and we do need to address this serious issue. Um, so we do that on our testimony supporting the intent. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Brian. Okay, that's it on the testifiers. Members, are there any questions? Okay, seeing none. Okay. Next. Yes. Yeah, but I have a question for the Department of This is for the Department of Ag. Um, this, right now, um, it's my understanding there's two shipping containers out of 100 that are being inspected. Um, with this, with the doubling of the fee, um, then double it to four out of every 100. Thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, you know, um, addition, in addition to uh, getting more resources, financial resources, you know, we do need to increase uh, the number of staff to do that. Um, we are progressing with uh, updating our database um, through e-manifesting. Um, we're in the training and rollout uh, with our stakeholders on doing that to be able to inspect uh, more efficiently, but you know we do need uh, additional staff, and you know with the hiring freeze that occurred because of the pandemic, um, we are moving to try and increase our staff that are not general funded. So that's our strategy. But okay, so of, uh, I'm sorry. In the, oh, go ahead. Uh, the increasing of the fee um, doesn't do it alone. Um, you know, we do need more more staff. Mm -hmm. So I guess just to clarify, then the increasing of the fee does not necessarily translate to more inspections. Uh, not I, not uh, absolutely. Um, I think increasing the fee and giving the department uh, more resources, you know, is appreciated and um, will make a difference. But we do need to you know, establish more positions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to Senate Bill 1055 relating to environmental impact statements. Uh, this measure amends the environmental impact statement law to delete reference to discretionary permits and allowing infrastructure improvements within a highway or public right of way to be exempt from environmental assessment requirements. And first up is Ed Sniffen from the Department of Transportation. Ed? Um, this is Lynn, a Rocky Regan. I'm not sure. Um, anyway, I, I think Ed is tied up with another meeting, but um, wanted to just could, um, wish oh, all of you a good afternoon. Lynn, a Rocky just, Regan just, from the state. He just popped up, Lynn. Oh, okay, great. Apologize, Senator. Um, All right. As yeah. for DOT uh, highways, uh, DOT stands on its um, um, is on our testimony support. Okay. Thank you, Ed. And next is Rodney Funakoshi from the Office of Planning. Oh, good afternoon, senators and chairs. Uh, Office of Planning stands on its written testimony in strong support of the measure. Thank you. Okay. And let's see, is anybody else? Also, Henry Curtis from Life of the Land. Thank you, 
Henry here? No, Henry. Okay. Hi, Senator. They're not present. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Uh, members, any questions for our testifiers? I have one question for Office of Planning. Uh, Rodney, um, do you see any uh, potential unintended consequences with the passage of this bill in terms of uh, environmental protections? Uh, no, not really. Uh, discretionary permits are defined as having, you know, already have a hearing, public hearing. And so, you know, these permits, you know, are already well heard and, you know, well, well aired with the public. And so, yeah, I see no, I see no adverse uh, consequences on that. Okay. All right, uh, members, what we're going to do on this, instead of being a decision making now, we're going to- uh, Sure, sure if I could just follow up on that. Um, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Chris. Thanks. Uh, thanks again, uh, Rodney, while you're there, I'm just reading through OEQC's testimony on this, and I recognize they're not uh, on the call with us today, but um, they basically, with respect to this bill, note that this is a substantial, quote, this is a substantial change from the practice of reviewing proposed large-scale projects and deserves substantial consideration and attention prior to implementation. So just following up on the chair's question, whether there'd be a significant change with respect to uh, environmental review generally. Uh, do you know what it is they're referring to? OEQC is referring to? Uh, no, I'm not aware of any major project that does not already have a, a hearing. By definition, discretionary permits requires a public hearing uh, in the bill itself. And so, you know, a lot of times, like some of these minor infrastructure connections are not. Um, you know, revealed until late in the game, like and design, preliminary design, when a lot of times land use permits are already, you know, have heard. And so it's almost like a, it catches a development at a very late stage, because we're talking about minor connections to relatively minor infrastructure uh, connections. And, you know, in reality, just about every project has to connect to a public street in some fashion. And so what this is, is, you know, treating, there's no difference in, in how you treat, uh, whether it's a major or minor project. If the, if the action is really an infrastructure connection, then that doesn't make sense to, for it to be a, an EIS trigger. So just reading on uh, with OEQC's testimony here, um, quote, the bill would have the unintended effect of improperly segmenting actions when there is a primary action component on private lands that does trigger uh, chapter 343. So essentially what you're saying is if you had a connection to some sort of public infrastructure, highway or whatever it might be, the review would then be on just on the that connection rather than the project as a whole? As it should be, yes. But, you know, it doesn't require necessarily an EIS type of action. You know, that should already have been captured in either the major zone change or whatever else requires a public hearing. That is, the, that is a major project action. And here we're talking about, you know, an infrastructure connection. Are there cases where it could go beyond an infrastructure connection? Oh, uh, no, that's what this exemption addresses. It's not the primary action, it's the secondary infrastructure connection is what this portion of uh, the statute refers to. So just reading on their testimony, they're basically saying that longstanding policy and administrative rules that govern the process um, have consistently prohibited the segmenting of projects into multiple components that are not considered comprehensively. So is there a risk that we're then getting away from any sort of comprehensive review in some cases? Uh, I don't see that necessarily. I mean, that's a tricky question. I mean, you know, like some, some major developments, for example, take decades to, to fully build out, you know, let's say Mililani or any of any major project. And so, you know, I'm not sure that there's necessarily any segmenting if the major environmental impacts are disclosed up front and mitigated in the course of the development, including infrastructure connections, I see no reason for uh, environmental concern. Sure. Just uh reading OEQC's testimony here. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, was, I wasn't aware of that, but yeah, I am. 
Sure. sure. I, I guess we can follow up with them and um, uh, follow up on some of that. Uh, sure. Thank you. Sir. Okay. So, thank member, you. Uh, what we'll do is we will uh, take a recess and we will do our decision making uh, after the joint uh, 105 hearing with transportation. Okay. We'll see you then. Okay. So, um, Thanks everybody. I guess uh, I don't have a gavel here, but we're, we're hearing one right now as we open up our 105 p.m. joint uh, transportation and agriculture agenda on two bills, SB 304 and SB 1309. So up first is SB 304. Um, and similarly, uh, for folks who are joining just for this agenda, um, we will limit your comments to two minutes just to make sure we can get through everything. And then also in case things get disconnected here, uh, we'll be able to follow up at a future date. Um, so we're going to go through the testifiers who did submit uh, actual testimony and intend to speak. So up first on SB 304, which is relating to carbon offsets and establishes procedures for the Department of Transportation to assist and enable a person to voluntarily purchase a carbon offset uh, for their travel. Um, testifying would be the Department of Transportation. Looks like with comments. Uh, uh, up good afternoon, Chair. Oh, good afternoon. Or, this is Lynn Araki Regan from the Department of Transportation. Uh, we stand on our written testimony offering comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, up next, Blue Planet Foundation. Good afternoon, Chair Lee, Chair Gabbard. Uh, good to see everyone this year and some new faces. Um, Mahalo for the opportunity to testify. Blue Planet Foundation supports Senate Bill 304. Um, this is one of the gaps that we have is addressing uh, um, carbon emissions from jet travel to Hawaii. It's really not counted for. Um, it's sort of an ambiguous area too in terms of who counts that carbon. So this is a common sense sort of approach just to give visitors the option to offset that and do it, uh, institutionalize it in a, in a way that's uh, meaningful for Hawaii. So we support um, this measure moving forward. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. Thanks very much. Um, that is all the um, in-person testimony we have. Are there any questions? Uh, if not, I have just uh, one for DOT, if you're still around. Yes, um, we have subject matter experts on the call. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I, I guess just, I'm not sure which one this is directed to, I guess, whoever you think is best um, appropriate, most appropriate within the department, but um, DOT's testimony notes that um, there are some federal restrictions with what can be done with uh, airport funded personnel and, and resources. And I just want to follow up on that to figure out where that line is drawn. Yeah, so, um, you, you know, according to our research, um, it, such usage of funds uh, to facilitate and provide process oversight would be a diversion of airport revenues um, and jeopardize uh, the Federal Aviation Administration grant assurances. Um, and. Yeah, if you need further explanation, I can, um, I believe we have staff on the call. Or I could sure. get back to you, Chair. Sure, that, that'd be fine. Um, uh, but just to follow up, in, in case you know offhand already, um, and this may be and require some follow up as well, but uh, if we establish some sort of uh, ability for people to voluntarily go in and um, offset their travel, purchasing um, you know, some sort of carbon offset, maybe it could go to DLNR or who knows what uh, to benefit the state as a whole. Um, do we have the ability to um, also require at the time of ticket purchase, if you're, if you're buying a ticket to Hawaii, for example, that that option is offered to you there? That is possible. Um, our only concern is utilizing airport personnel to, to conduct whatever transaction um, if it is limited to uh, airlines personnel to do that, you know, it, it, it wouldn't jeopardize any FAA funding on our part. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I have a question. Senator Rhodes. Uh, for DOT, thanks. 
So is there not a, uh, a, I mean, you know, this is, this is the problem of the problem of our generation, probably the problem of our generation for several generations. Uh, there's not an exemption or something that we could ask for, for something that's so clearly related to air travel and the, and the effects of air travel. You know, we could we could route whatever exemption suggestion and um, have FAA uh, comment on it. Um, you know, through our experience, it, it's not a speedy process to get um, an opinion from them or an exemption, you know, approved. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we could definitely make an attempt and get back to you at a later date. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Any further questions on this measure? If not, thanks very much, everybody. Let's move on to the next measure, SB 1309, relating to electric vehicles, which establishes an electric vehicle incentive program through a one-time tax on the purchase of vehicles that are not zero emissions vehicles. And testifying first on 1309 is the Department of Taxation. Yes, Chair. Jonathan White, on behalf of the Director of Tax, will stand on our written testimony providing comments. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, the State Energy Office. Hello, this is Chris Junker on behalf of Scott Glenn. We'll stand on our written testimony with comments and are available for questions. Thank you. Uh, testify next, Public Utilities Commission. Uh, good afternoon, chairs, members of the committees. Uh, we'll stand on our written testimony offering comments as well and uh, available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Up next is the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Uh, thank you, Chair <clears throat> and Senators. Tom Yamachika from Tax Foundation. Uh, we have submitted written testimony. Our primary concerns are uh, that this is a tax increase uh, and uh, uh, that it is um, further earmarking tax revenues uh, uh, in derogation of the budget process. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, JN Automotive. Mr. Nikolai. Hi, good afternoon. It's Brad Nikolai from JN Automotive. Um, yeah, you know, we have submitted written testimony, but we also feel like, um, you know, this is really focused on a particular um, group of people. And it's not a very efficient tax, especially when you start to add um, all the various taxes involved. We have a import tax, a GE tax, a 1% proposed tax on anything over $50,000, another 10% on everything over $60,000. You know, this is, when you start to add these things up, we're looking at a 20% tax on a lot of these vehicles in which are gonna impact more than just a luxury vehicle. We're a Chevy dealer in which a lot of our vehicles that are sold are trucks and SUVs. In fact, the overall market, 72% of the vehicles sold in Hawaii are falling in that segment. And similar to family housing and the way people live, these are really utilitarian and family vehicles. And I believe the impact is gonna have a, a more dramatic effect on a larger group of people than just a small segment. Historically, if we just looked back in 1991, when the federal government imposed a 10% luxury tax uh, on all vehicles over $30,000, we saw a decrease nationally in registrations of 23%. And this could have the same implications on us here in Hawaii. And that's dramatic because it's gonna affect employment, it's gonna affect investment in Training is going to affect investments that we make in facilities and commitments to manufacturers if we see a similar like impact as a result of a measure like this. And when you look at this, all the burden is falling on local dealers when in fact Tesla is the largest EV provider here in Hawaii. If you could they uh, sell, summarize, they please. Sell the majority, they sell the majority of the vehicles here. they should bear a lot of that burden, if anything, rather than having all the local dealers having to pay for it or pass it on to our customers. Thank you, Mr. Nikolai. Up next is Hawaiian Electric Company. 
Good afternoon, Chair. Hawaiian Electric stands on written testimony uh, supporting the intent of this bill. Thank you. Up next, uh, Hawaii Energy. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. Brian Kealoha, Hawaii Energy. We stand on our written testimony, providing comments, and are here to answer any questions should they arise. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tesla. Thank you, Chair Lee and Chair Gabbard. This is Sandy Wong on behalf of Tesla. Uh, Chair Gabbard, I just wanted to let you know that I apologize for our not addressing you in our salutation or in our written testimony. Um, I did not write the testimony because I would never forget you, Chair Gabbard. Uh, but saying that, uh, we support this, test, um, this bill and we have submitted written testimony. We would offer a friendly amendment uh, we would ask the committee to suggest using some of the tax revenues to incentivize the purchase of EVs um, as a rebate for EVs, but otherwise we're in strong support of this measure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, up next is the Alliance for Automotive Innovation. Good afternoon, Chair Lee, Chair Gabbard, and members of the Joint Committees. I am Tiffany Ajima on behalf of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation. The automobile manufacturers do oppose this measure. Um, while the intent of the bill is to tax so-called wealthy consumers, um, uh, of purchasers of high-end gasoline-powered vehicles, uh, this tax will actually reach all segments of consumers. We are especially concerned that this would impact agriculture, construction, and trades disproportionately because there are no electric alternatives to the types of trucks and vans used by contractors, plumbers, electricians, farmers, and other tradesmen. In addition, families or special interests will also get swept up in this bill because they may require larger vehicles. And with many cars and trucks um, costing more than $60,000 and with no electric alternatives, to some of these, the purchasers of these cars would be forced to pay the tax. Um, for cars and trucks that do fall below this price point, we are concerned that consumers may forego important safety features and add-ons to stay under the price point and not be subject to that 10% tax. Um, you know, there's, there's also no relationship between cost and energy efficiencies in vehicles. In fact, the most fuel efficient vehicles cost more than the threshold in this bill. And it, again, it might cause consumers to choose less fuel efficient vehicles to avoid this tax. For these reasons, we respectfully oppose this measure and ask that you hold it. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, Blue Planet Foundation. Thank you, uh, Chair Lee, Chair Gabbard. Uh, Blue Planet Foundation strongly supports Senate Bill 1309. This seeks to address the biggest barrier to our low carbon transportation future, which is available charging. Um, particularly charging in multifamily buildings and at workplaces. Uh, this measure seeks to expand the successful rebate program that um, Hawaii Energy is currently uh, running. Um, and it does it in a very clever way, which we've heard, which is assigning a small fee to luxury gasoline vehicles. So that narrow segment to provide funding for charging infrastructure, which is so, uh, sorely needed. Um, again, it's a very targeted revenue neutral uh, mechanism, so we don't have to spend general funds to support uh, the charging infrastructure. These vehicles that we're talking about are, are the high-end Mercedes, BMWs, Lexus. It's not the, the, the everyday vehicle. Um, it's also not a lot of the trucks. In fact, we took a look at the most popular vehicle in Hawaii, which is the Toyota Tacoma. Uh, there's a few dozen for sale right now at Servco, and all of them are under $45,000, so they wouldn't be subject to this. But the bottom line is we need, in this decisive decade, to get gasoline cars off our roads and to transition to zero emission vehicles. This is a small step in that direction by assigning a small fee to luxury gas vehicles and supporting our needed um, uh, charging infrastructure uh, in multifamily buildings and workplaces. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. That is all the uh, in-person testimony we have uh, here today. Are there any questions? Chair, sure, I have a question. Senator Gabbard. Uh, for Hawaii Energy, I wanted to, uh, do you have any estimate on how much revenue that this 10% tax on luxury vehicles would generate annually? Ballpark, so, whatever? We, we 
we don't have data on auto sales, so we don't have an idea of, of how much it would generate. Um, what we did provide in our written testimony is kind of the pace in which we're administrating the uh, currently Act 142 and the level of, of rebates based on the current legislation, but we, we don't have an estimate on how much this would bring in. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Sure thing. Uh, Senator Nishihara, did you have your hand up earlier? Yeah, I had my hand up because I had a question about um, these only refer to those uh, consumer vehicles, right? Like vehicles. They're not like transportation vehicles, like large trucks and things like that. Uh, the way it's written, I have to double check. I think it is fairly encompassing. Uh, let me pull that up. Oh, let me get back to you on that in just a second. Um, so I don't hold the whole thing up. Are there other folks who have questions? Um, for on this measure, I have a question, Chair. Senator Rhodes, is it Mr. Nikolai still here? Yes, I'm available. Um, I, I had a, it sounded the statistics that you quoted. Thank you for sticking around. Um, the statistics that you quoted about the luxury tax from whenever that was the '90s. You said that um, uh, purchasing purchases of luxury cars went down by. Did I hear you correctly that you said it went down by 23 percent? There is an overall impact on the entire industry. So from 1991, it was introduced through 2002, it was scaled back. But in the first two to three years, it was at 10%. At that point, nationally, there was a decline of 23% over two years. Of, of a specific segment of the market or? The entire segment of the market. So why would uh, the luxury tax affect the entire market? We were already in a challenging recessionary oh, okay. I got you. environment. And then they coupled it with this 10% luxury tax. It's not any different than what's happening here in Hawaii. Well, my question, my question is, it, it sounds to me like from those statistics that that means that this bill would work. It would do exactly what it is intended to do, which is to reduce the number of gas powered luxury vehicles, which I mean, you're, you're a Chevrolet dealer, I think you said. I mean, hasn't GM just recently announced that they're going entirely electric in 15 years, was it? 2035? Yeah, so you, exactly, 15 years. But you want to impose this now. Last year, of the 400 somewhat vehicles that we sold, we were allocated five Chevy Bolts. You can't build a business model. Yeah, well, I hear you there. Five Chevy Bolts. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um Sorry, Nishihara, um, just getting back to you, I just read through the bill. The bill applies to passenger cars and pickup trucks as defined in HRS. Okay, thank you. So not major transportation vehicles like trucks, right? Yeah, I don't believe that's in the HRS definition as far as I can see right here in front of me right now. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Um, if not, just real quick for energy, uh, the, yeah, the energy office. If you're still here. Um, yes. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, just following up, I think, on the, the discussion, um, I think that was just had a minute ago about the speed of transition. Senator Rhodes noted GM um, announcing they're no longer selling gas cars by 2035. And obviously, Tesla is 100% electric right now. And there's probably going to be a bunch of other manufacturers somewhere in between um, or announcing something in the next few years. So where we're at now with fairly limited EV charging infrastructure, I think, per capita. Um, assuming that everything does switch over in 15 years time, for all the folks who are basically in urban Honolulu, in apartment buildings and multi-use dwellings where you can't just you know plug in in your garage, um, I mean, really, what's going to happen to those folks if we actually don't have funding to provide some sort of mechanism to do this? I mean, is, is it realistic to assume there's going to be like a market adjustment uh, of sorts? Um, I think you hit on to this, Chris Yunker. Thank you, uh, Chair Lee, for the question. Um, we obviously need to get infrastructure uh, installed right now. There hasn't been a widespread solution. Uh, hopefully in the future, the adoption would be high enough that it would warrant um, more market-based solutions. But to get there, you need to have that adoption. So I believe that support from the state uh, for 
charging infrastructure is the chicken or the egg. And I believe that you do need the charging infrastructure in place in order to get that type of adoption. Thanks. And then if I could follow up with Mr. Nikolai again, um, you did in your testimony, um, I don't think you referenced it in your, your oral testimony, but in your written testimony, you raised a really good point, which is if you have a really high um, tax or fee or something on the sale of cars locally, there's nothing to stop someone from going to San Francisco or Portland or wherever it might be, buying a car, putting it on a, a barge and shipping it over. We, we, already, we already see some of that already. These customers are smart enough to think that they're going to try and circumvent paying up to 20% when you start pyramiding all these fees and taxes on top of it. They're going to look at loopholes in Montana. They're going to look at Oregon. They're going to look at Washington. You're going to lose 100% of that revenue. And that, that money is going to leave out of state. It doesn't stay locally with us dealers who employ people from Waianae to Waimanalo who put the tax revenue back into the state. That's going to leave, and you're not going to be able to track that. They're not going to let a $900 shipping fee circumvent them from avoiding just on your base number of $60,000 around $12,000 in taxes and fees. It's going to happen. That's the reality of how it works. And I don't understand why we, the dealers, should be passing that on. Tesla's worth almost $800 billion. More than 32 times some of the largest manufacturers in the world. But they're not going to pay for any of this. They're the, they're the biggest beneficiary of it. All our manufacturers are trying to make the most efficient vehicles as possible. They're investing in EV technologies. But you can't snap your fingers and say, here you go. You don't have product available. We sold five Chevy Bolts because that's all they gave us. We sold 34 Audi e-trons because that's all they gave us. It's not as if we don't want to move in that direction, but you have to build a roadmap and transition into it. We are not the manufacturers of these vehicles, but the dealers, the retailers are having to bear the burden of potentially losing dramatically as a result of the impact on our overall business. That's going to translate into lost jobs. That'll happen. And again, March 23rd, we had to lay off 50% of our company. We're barely getting back to it. It's a tough road. And then now you want to make it even more difficult? Sure. That's so let me. Fair. Thanks. Thanks for weighing in on that. Um, again, uh, I think something to hopefully ease your mind just a little bit, um, even though there's a lot of bills with various different mechanisms doing all this stuff, there's certainly no way they're all going to pass and stack on top of each other. So that's. Um, uh, hopefully a little bit of relief there. Um, that said, I really do appreciate your point about the um, disparity between, you know, buying local versus overseas and all of that. And that's something I, I think we can all um, think about. Um, so that said, let me, um, oh, and the final thing, I, I know you'd mentioned um, the tax on 60,000, just to be clear, the way the bill's written, um, any new tax would apply only to the value over 60,000. So if you're buying a $60,000 car, you're not paying a single penny more. Uh, at least under this measure. And I can't speak to the others that you had referenced that are you know, in other places in the legislature. Um, but that said, thank you. Um, are there any other questions on this measure? If not, all right, why don't we um, recess for decision-making and, and for the members, just remember we have um, the AEN agenda as well. So I guess we'll all be in the same breakout room on both of these agendas. Uh, so we'll all be right back. Thank you, everybody. Okay, welcome back folks. We are reconvening the one o'clock joint AEN TRS hearing uh, for decision making. And we'll start off with the AEN bills, uh, Senate Bill 32 relating to infrastructure. So the um, members, the, the PUC regulates 41 smaller rural public water and sewer utilities, but not the larger county ones like the Board of Water Supply. So these are the facilities that would be covered by this bill. So both the consumer advocate and the PUC, they mentioned that the legislature should consider expanding this to other agencies that have 
road work permit oversight. Uh, but their suggestions are actually beyond the scope of this bill as proposed. So having conferred, the chairs having conferred and also with the members, the recommendation will be to pass SB 32 as <coughs> is. Any comments? Okay, I'll take the vote for AEN. <coughs> Uh, chair votes aye, Vice Chair Nishihara. Vice Chair Nishihara. Oh, aye. Senator Ocasio. Aye. Senator Rhodes. Aye. Senator Favela. Aye. Uh, Senator Lee, would you like to take it for? Yes. Thank you. Uh, for Committee on Transportation, same recommendation. I'll vote aye. Uh, Vice Chair Inouye is, I believe, excused. Uh, Senator English, excused. Senator Shimabukuro. Aye. Thank you. And Senator Favela. Aye. Thank you. Sorry, Chair. I, I think uh, Senator Shimabukuro needs to actually be on a on the video for it to count, to oh. just, so, just so there's no okay. question about whether it's a valid vote. I'm trying, I'm, I'm getting blocked. Second. Sorry, one second. <laughs> okay. There okay, sorry. Yes. <laughs> I. It's not an imposter. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, measure adopted. Okay, thank you, members. Moving on to SB 491 relating to inspection fees. While uh, this chair definitely supports uh, efforts to uh, address invasive species, based on the concerns raised by Department of Ag and the Retail Merchants Association on the potential impacts to businesses, we're gonna be deferring this bill indefinitely. And then moving on to SB 1055 relating to environmental impact statements. Um, while the chair acknowledges uh, the concerns raised about this bill's potential impact on the environmental review process, <coughs> Given that it's part of the governor's package and DOT, Office of Planning and City DPP support the bill, it seems to me that it deserves additional discussion. So having conferred, chairs having conferred and the recommendation will be to pass SB 1055 with a defective date, July 1st, 2050, that's 2050, effective date and tech amendments. Any comments? I'll take the vote for AEN. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair Nishihara. Senator Nishihara. Oh, sorry. No, it got deep. It muted me again. Aye. <laughs> Senator Ocasio. <laughs> I'm sorry. Senator Ocasio. <laughs> okay. Senator Rhodes. Reservations. Senator Favela. No. Okay. Um, Senator Lee, would you like to take the votes for TRS? Okay, TRS, same recommendation. I'll vote aye. Um, noting the excused absences of Senator Inouye and Senator English. Um, Senator Shimabukuro. Aye. And Senator Favela. Aye. Sorry, that was, that was an aye. Aye. No vote, no vote. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, measures adopted. Thank you, members. And that concludes the one o'clock joint AENTRS. Mahalo. So moving on to the um, joint 105 TRS AEN. Up first is Senate Bill 304. This is the um, uh, carbon offset bill for folks flying into state. Um, recommendation is to move this forward. It's a, it's a good discussion. Um, we have some details to work out. So I would like to move it forward with a couple amendments. Um, first, um, noting that uh, we'd like to ask DLNR to help out um, in determining what is the verified so CO2 offset. And then secondly, um, removing the uh, reference to kiosks in the airports and manned um, uh, DOT personnel that would be implementing. Uh, and then we'll also note in the committee report that um, we'd like to figure out how to uh, maximize public uh, reach with this and actually implement in a meaningful way. So we recognize this goes on for um, a few more committees through the legislature, uh, hopefully. 
and we can continue the discussion. So any questions or comments on this? If not, uh, I'll take the vote for TRS. I'll vote aye. Senator, or excuse me, uh, Vice Chair Inoy is excused. And Senator English is excused. Senator Shimabukuro? Aye. And Senator Favela? Oh, did he just, oh, there you are. Aye. Thank you. Measures adopted. Senator Gabbard. Okay, for AEN, uh, same recommendation. Any comments? Chair votes aye. Vice Chair Nishihara. That's on 304, right? Yes. yes. Um, aye. Senator Ocasio. Aye. Senator Rhodes. Aye. Senator Favela. Aye. Thank you, members. The measure passes. Thank you. Moving on to SB 1309. Uh, this is relating to uh, the uh, EV infrastructure program and fees. I really want to appreciate the um, comments from some of the folks in the industry who commented throughout the hearing. Um, we did want to continue the conversation, noting that we have a limited number of years, 14 years before GM uh, converts to all electric cars, and we won't have an option for gas even if we want it anymore. Um, and certainly there are other manufacturers like Tesla and Nissan and others that are well on the way beforehand. So I wanted to address, um, I think, some of the concerns raised by the industry. So we want to make a couple changes here. The first is uh, in order to prevent local car dealers from being um, beat out unfairly by mainland dealers, if there's a fee or a tax that applies only to purchases locally, um, we'd like to try and rectify that by changing uh, the mechanism here from a tax to a registration fee on, on vehicle registrations. That way, no matter where you get your car from, uh, it's covered equally and fairly. Um, secondly, you want to blank that fee out because we don't want to uh, make any assumptions about revenue and other things that we hope uh, folks will weigh in on in the future committees. So that'll be a blank uh, registration fee. Uh, thirdly, I think pursuant to some of the uh, comments that were made from uh, one of the manufacturers, uh, we'd also like to give the PUC discretion to be able to use uh, funding for EV rebates for those folks that um, need financial help the most. Um, so similar to the infrastructure program where the PUC has discretion to set up how those funds are being used, we just like to add that in to their discretion um, for the future. And then finally, um, I'd like to put a defective date of 2050 on the bill. And then finally, note in the committee report that um, We'd like to work with the uh, vehicle registration department departments at the counties uh, to figure out how best to um, apply the process going forward. So defective date, blank fees, and um, hopefully we can continue the discussion to figure out if there's something here that makes sense for everyone given the limited amount of time to address the issue. So any comments or discussion on that? If not, all right, I'll take the vote for TRS on SB 1309, recommendation to pass with amendments. I'll vote aye, uh, noting the excused absence of Senators Inoy and English. Uh, Senator Shimabukuro? Aye. And Senator Favela? Aye. Thank you. Measures adopted. Okay. Same recommendation for AEN. Any comments? Chair votes aye. Vice Chair Nishi. Aye. Yeah, um, you know, I, I appreciate the uh, the changes that the uh, chair for transportation did, but um, I would like to um, vote with reservations until we see the final end of the bill. Thank you, Senator Ocasio. Aye. Senator Rhodes. Aye. Senator Favela. Aye. The measure passes. Thank you, members. Thank you very much. That rounds us out. Appreciate the good work of the AEN committee. Thanks, everybody. And the TRS. Join. Thank you very much, you guys. Aloha. Aloha. So we done?
Aloha and welcome to the joint AEN PSM hearing. It's Wednesday, February 10th, 2021. And uh, today's joint hearing, including the audio and video of remote participants, is being streamed live on YouTube. You'll find links to viewing options for all Senate meetings on the live and on demand video page of the legislature's website at capital.hawaii.gov. And in the unlikely event that we have to abruptly end this hearing due to major technical difficulties, the committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business at 2.15 p.m. on February 12th during our AEN via video conference time slot and a public notice will be posted on the legislature's website. For those of you who are testifying, all testifiers audio will be muted and video disabled until shortly before it's your turn to testify. And because of our 90 minute time limit for each of the AEN hearings, uh, there'll be a two minute time limit for all testifiers and we'll have a virtual countdown timer on the Zoom screen. So please be aware of the timer. Uh, I'll be announcing only the testifiers who, who will be providing testimony via Zoom. And for the complete list of testifiers, along with all of the written testimony, please go to the legislature's website and you'll find a link on the status page for the measure. We apologize if the closed captioning doesn't accurately describe the names. So for this uh, hearing, we have two measures. Uh, first is SB 489 relating to agricultural buildings. It increases the maximum area for each agricultural shade cloth structure, coal frame and greenhouse that could qualify the structure for an exemption from building permit and building code requirements. And let's see, testifiers. First up is uh, Dean Nicholas Comerford from CTAR. Thank you, chairs and committee members. CTAR is, uh, would like to stand on his testimony in strong support of this measure. Thank you, Dean. Next is John Okudara from Alun Farms. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for this opportunity. We stand in strong support of this bill, uh, but require, I request that you consider removing the cap on the size. Uh, Alun was approached several, a couple of years ago by Operation Kong Mauru to build greenhouses on a development in central Oahu. Uh, each of the greenhouses they were proposing was one hectare, which is over 100,000 square feet. Uh, we think it's uh, the arbitrarily setting the amount area at 60,000 square feet um, isn't makes it difficult when you're looking at a larger size. At that time, when we approached the Department of Planning and Permitting, if as long as the buildings were commercially designed and manufactured, the department's main concern was that it meet electrical and plumbing requirements, which we agree should not be installed by any old person. So with those changes, we strongly support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, John. Next is Brian Miyamoto from the Hawaii Farm Bureau. Thank you, Chair. The Hawaii Farm Bureau will stand on its written testimony support. Chair, we just like to um, note that uh, these larger structures, uh, if it's increased to 60,000 or as Mr. Orkadara say, even larger, uh, must still comply with all applicable state and county zoning laws. In addition, no electrical power or plumbing systems can be connected to the structure without first obtaining the appropriate county permits and any wastewater disposal must comply with the State Department of Health regulations. We believe greenhouse technology is the future uh, for Hawaii agriculture and it's gonna play a big role in growing our industry. So we uh, ask that you support this measure. Thank you, Chair. Mahalo, Brian. Okay, members, any questions for our testifiers? Okay. Seeing none, we shall move on to the next measure, Senate Bill 573 relating to wildlife, requires all habitat conservation plans to include an agreement for plan participants to enter into and maintain an annual service contract with a standby and response facility available to provide emergency medical and rehabilitation services to native wildlife affected by activities undertaken within the plan area. Testifiers. First up is David Smith from DLNR. Hi, Senator. They're not present. Okay. Um, actually, uh, hi. Oh. This is Afshin. 
Siddiqui, I'm um, on behalf of DLNR, um, and we stand behind our testimony in support of this measure. Okay, thank you, Afshin. Thank you. All right, and that's it on the testifiers. Any questions, members? I have a question for DLNR. Afshin, can you come back? Okay. Um, it was mentioned in uh, DLNR's testimony that the bill will increase costs for renewable energy providers. So do you have any idea how big of an impact uh, you see that being? Um, that's a hard question. I don't know what um, numbers that would look like. It would depend on the contracts between the facilities that the, re, um, that the renewable energy industry would have to make with the contractors. So I don't have a cost, but it is something that they would have to consider if that's another um, additional requirement for those projects. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, Efshin. So um, rather than go into decision-making, we'll do that at the end like we did with the uh, TRS joint. Uh, we'll turn it over to Senator Nishihara for his measures. Thank you. Um, we're uh, going to do Senate Bill 175 relating to intoxicating liquor, exempt certain applications from the automatic refusal provision that may be invoked by a majority of nearby voters or real estate owners, specifically application for a class of one license on land designated as agricultural by state or county zoning laws, and for which the majority of the agricultural commodities used in the manufacturing of the liquor are grown and produced in the state by the license holder. And uh, for the first testifier, we have um, Les Trent for LBD Coffee. Les, are you uh, there? Les Trent, LBD Coffee. We'll stand in our testimony. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Humschild, CEO and founder of Lanikai Brewing Company. Hi, thanks chair and vice chair for the opportunity to testify. Um, I'm in support, but I'd like to recommend the amendment to include class 18 manufacturers licenses. Um, class one licenses within the state of Hawaii make you designate whether you're gonna do beer or wine or spirits, whereas a class 18 license allows you to do all of those things, beer, wine, and spirits. Um, it doesn't allow you to produce as much as a class wine, uh, one does, but a class 18 has different limitations. So I'm supportive with uh, proposed amendments to add in class 18 licenses. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Okay. Thank you, Steve. That brings us to the end of our uh, list of testifiers. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to um, Chair uh, Gabbard. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. So what we'll do is go into uh, decision-making now, Matt. Okay, recess room is opening now. Thank you. Hey folks, we are reconvening the decision making on uh, the joint hearing of AEN and PSM. Uh, two measures we're dealing with, SB 489 relating to agricultural buildings, increases the maximum area for each agricultural shade cloth structure, coal frame and greenhouse that could qualify the structure for an exemption from building permit and building code requirements. Uh, having conferred with the members, uh, Actually, it was last session that the same bill, House Bill 2192, is very close to passage. Um, and increasing the allowable size of greenhouses will benefit our farmers, uh, definitely. So having conferred, the recommendation will be to pass SB 489 as is. Uh, members, any comments? Okay, taking the vote for AEN, chair votes aye. Vice Chair Nishihara. 
Aye. Senator Ocasio? Aye. Senator Rhodes? Aye. Senator Favela? Aye. Mahalo members, and uh, measure passes AE, and I'll turn it over to Senator Nishihara for the vote. Thank you. Um, we're doing Senate Bill 175, and I'm going to pass it with amendments. As... No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We're doing 489. We're doing 489. Yeah, we're doing joint, uh, the one we had joint at 145. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Senate Bill 583. 573? No. 489. 489. Oh. Okay. Chair sure goes aye. Passes is. Um, Senator English is excused. Senator Baker. Aye. Okay, Senator Revere. Aye. Okay, and Senator Favela. Aye. Thank you. Motion's okay. adopted. Thank you, members. The member, uh, the measure passes. Moving to SB 573 relating to wildlife habitat conservation plans. Requires all habitat conservation plans to include an agreement for plan participants to enter into and maintain an annual service uh -huh. contract with a standby and response facility available to provide emergency medical and rehabilitation services to native wildlife affected by activities undertaken within the planned area. And so having conferred with the members, uh, the recommendation will be to pass SB 573 as is. Any comments? Seeing none, the chair votes aye. Senator Nishihara, vice chair. Okay, for the... Yeah, public safety, same recommendation. No, this is just for AEN, uh, Clarence. Oh, I'm sorry, for AEN. 573, Vice Chair. Oh, okay. Aye. Bye. Sorry. Okay. Senator Ocasio? Aye. Senator Rhodes? Aye. Senator Favela? Aye. The measure passes. AEN, turning it over to you, Senator Nishihara for PSM. Okay, thank you. For um, Senate Bill 489, uh, same recommendation to pass it as is. 573. Oh, 573. I'm yeah, sorry. we already voted on 489. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, my, my bad. Okay, Senate Bill 573, uh, recommendation to pass it as is. Chair goes aye. Um, Senator Baker. Aye. Senator English is excused. Senator Revere. Aye. Okay, thank you. And uh, Senator Vivella. Aye. Thank you. Motion is adopted. Okay. Senator Nishihara, you have your uh, SB 175? Yes, for Senate Bill. Uh, 175 um, recommendations to pass it with amendments as described, um, as noted. And the amendment would be, let me get that sheet again. Okay, the amendment is to include class 18 license holders as well as SMA tech amendments for the past with amendments. Chair goes aye. And the vote sheet is here. Okay, are we ready? Okay, Senate Bill 175, pass it with amendments. Chair goes aye, Senate Jenkins excuse. And the Baker. Aye. Senator Revere. Aye. And Senator Favela. Aye. Senator Favela. Thank you. Motion is adopted. Same recommendation for AEN. Um, chair votes aye. Vice Chair Nishihara. Um, aye. Senator Ocasio. Uh, yes, with reservations. Senator Rhodes. Aye. Senator Favela. Aye. Thank you, members. The measure passes. Okay.
Clarence, so that winds it up, right? All pal. Right. All pal. Thank yeah. You. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Aloha. Aloha. Bye. -bye.